And I've entitled this, The Greatest Story Ever Told. That's what I want to talk to you about. So you have to ask yourself, what is the greatest story? If you're a story, if you're a storyteller to your children or to people, what's the greatest story that you could ever tell? What would it be? What is that greatest story? Grab your Bibles and go over to Luke chapter 2. Of course, this is probably what most people are preaching out of the, all of today anyway. I want you to stand with me at the reading of God's Word. Luke chapter 2. We'll pick it up here at verse 11. Luke 2 verse 11. Look what the Bible says here. And we're talking about the greatest story ever told. And here's what he says. For unto you, the angel is speaking, for unto you, who believes in angels? Who believes, who believes the angel sent from God is going to tell us something here? I mean, he's going to tell us the truth. You believe that? He's from God. Not an angel of light, but this is from God. Look Now, listen to this here. So, if we, if we even have to even think in our little minds whether or not Christianity is real or not, and the serving of Jesus is real or not, it comes, it bases itself on one thing. It's the very first principle of the Christian faith. And there are five principles, basic principles of the Christian faith. Five basic principles. And the very first basic principle is this here, is that the Word of God is the inspired Word of God. It is God-breathed. And if you don't believe that, then we don't need to talk about anything else. But if you believe that this is God-inspired, then we can base everything off of that, off of truth, then can't we? That what God has said. So look at what he says here in Luke chapter 2, verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a what? A Savior. Which is, now look at here, they were looking for the Christos. They were looking for the Christ. They were looking for one to come. Israel was looking for the anointed one, the Christos. And look what the angel says. In the city of David, a Savior, which is the Christos, the anointed one. The one that you, now look who he's telling. He's telling a bunch of shepherds. <laughs> is Christ the Lord. And this, now look at this one here. And this shall be a what? A sign. That, hey, I'm telling you, he's the Christ. He's the Christos. He's the anointed one. And when you get there, you're not even going to really go, which one are we talking about? He says, now this is the sign. God said, I'm going to go give you a sign. Unto you, ye shall find this baby, this babe, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. That's how you're going to know he's the anointed one, he's the Christos. I'm, I'm pointing them out to you. There he is right there. And then when we go down to what? Verse... 20, and the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told to them because they were going to tell everybody the greatest story that could ever be told. Father, we love you and thank you for today and thank you for your blessings. And as we minister this word today, the greatest story ever told, help me to be effective in delivering this message to the people of God, to the house of God, and to those who may be on the fringes and not understanding about the greatest story ever told. I pray, Father, right now, and I bind the spirit of Jezebel that would try to come against us and any hindering spirit that would be here. We bind you and command you to go to the four corners of the property. And we bind the strong men and people that would not receive the word today. Lord, let it penetrate, go deep into the heart today. As we open our hearts to receive what you'll speak into us. Lord, I thank you for what you're going to do with this word. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody says, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I'm preaching the message today. The greatest story ever told. It is the Christmas season. And when you look at the television, you will find out there that there are Christmas stories everywhere. Sister Schaefer says she did not care. What? Television package we get, whether it be Netflix, Dish, Direct TV, 
or any variation thereof, Comcast or whatever you've got, it must have one thing. The Hallmark Channel must be available. It has to be the Hallmark Channel. It has to be on there. And one of the things that our DVD is able to do, I think we can record up to five things at one time. Now, God came up with the one so that you don't have to miss church service at all. He came up with a DVR, the VCR, no excuse. Record it, go to church. You can be at church and you can record what you want to watch on television. We can record five things at one time so that he, stepped, he pretty much wiped it out. Any excuse of missing church on Sunday or any special day. Somebody shout amen. amen. Just put the VCR on or the DVR, whatever you're going to do. But it must be able to record the Christmas stories. All the Christmas stories that are there on Hallmark. It eats, I don't know how many hours, but it's full. It's full of Christmas stories because I think they start in December. I mean in October, earlier than what y'all think in November. They start way before November. Y'all just don't watch the Hallmark Channel, I can tell. So here's the thing. There's Christmas stories everywhere. There are books that are written about it. Twas the night before Christmas. It's all it's spoken of. I, you know what? And I was thinking about all the TV specials that are out there. All the TV specials, the, the year without Santa Claus or Santa Claus is coming to town. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, that's all over television. Frosty the Snowman, Charlie Brown, Christmas. All these are things that are on their movies. I mean, there's all kinds of movies that are there's the Polar Express. Elf, anybody know what I'm talking about? Elf, the big tall elf, Home Alone. I like Home Alone. Or It's a Wonderful Life, but that's a Home Alone. Some people just like Home Alone. I mean, uh, It's a Wonderful Life. Or the Christmas vacation, and you got, I have every variation of this, the Christmas story. The Christmas story. I love the Christmas story. And it's going to come on, I think, tonight at 8 o'clock. And it will run for 24 hours. And I will watch it. Everywhere I go, I'm going to be watching the Christmas story. So Christmas is about stories. And we love the stories because there had, there's something in common about them. Here's what happens with these Christmas stories is that they capture our desire for hope, our desire for love and faith. And there's something in a story that we like to sit down and just to be entertained. I love to be entertained by a good story or a good movie. You see, and they captured this hope and desire. They, they touch something deep with inside of every one of us, and it's a longing for things to be right in the whole world. That's what we're looking for, is what can be right in the world. When I watch this here, I, I escape from this reality around us, and I, 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 I'm in, inside this story. Or inside this movie here, you see there's something that has in common with them all. There's a fantasy element of them about it. Or there are myths that really aren't real. But we wish that they were real, but they're not real. See, all the stories that we watch at Christmas time have this, this thing in common. But today I want to talk to you about the real Christmas story. I'm going to give you my version of it because I've been doing this a long time. But I have never really preached about... The, the, the real Christmas story. So when, you, when, I, when I talk about the real Christmas story and I talk about the greatest story that's ever told, well, I've had, I've preached every year, I've preached all kinds of stuff about Christmas, but telling the greatest story ever told. So let this be an epitaph on my funeral if the Lord doesn't come back that Pastor Schaefer preached and talked to you about the greatest story ever told. Because you need to know the greatest story ever told. You need to be able to relate this to other people. The greatest story ever told. Somebody shout amen. amen. And look what he says here. Because it is part of a this Christmas story. And the time that we are in. Or if you don't like to use the word Christmas or a mass for Christ. The birth of Christ is in the Bible. Everybody. And oh, by the way, just let me go ahead and throw this out here. You, you do know over in, in Iran right now, uh, they're not talking about this. 
There's countries that won't allow you to let you talk about Christ and talk about Christmas. They won't let you talk about the birth of Christ. You can't talk about it. And you know, there's a spirit at work in the church. Don't want you to talk about that. It's in the Bible, everybody. Somebody shout amen. But you having an understanding of the story is what we want to talk about. So it's the greatest story ever told, but because it's the greatest story ever told, this Christmas season, this Christmas story about what the shepherds were involved in is only a small portion of the bigger story that's ever told, of the greatest story that could ever This is only a small portion of the entire story. And the Christmas story, the Christmas birth is not the greatest story ever told. It's only a small part of the, in, the whole story. It's like a scene in a movie. It's just like an act in a play. Which one's the greatest? It's the whole play. Because it tells the whole story. So it, it is, this story is real. Here's what he says in Luke chapter 2. And in verse 1 he says, And in those days, this is real, this is real, y'all. Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken... Of the entire Roman world. Y'all don't think the Antichrist can do what he wants to do with the entire world? When he comes, he'll have more power than Caesar Augustus. And Caesar Augustus made a decree that everybody would be accounted for. Isn't that amazing? In the whole world, in the Roman world. That was the known, the known world that was conquered at that time through the Rome, Roman. And this was the first census that took place while Quinarius was governor of Syria. And you know, Syria is still in the Bible. <laughs> and it's still over there today, but we're looking at Damascus getting ready to be destroyed. But this is still, that's part of a story, but this is the st part of this story. And everyone went to their own town to register. This story is a real story. It happened in histories. In movies, these, the, the following is based like on the true story, the actual events. And in the movies, when you look at this, it, they capture your attention in a real way. When they are real, I'm talking about real movies. Movies about a real event. Movies about something that really happened. I'm not talking about Star Trek. I'm a Trekkie. I'm not talking about Star Trek. I'm not talking about... I'm not talking about... Space Wars, or I'm talking about a movie that is based on a real fact. When you look at that documentary and you look at it, you see it through the writer's eyes of that documentary. And the real story has more meaning to you. Like when you go watch this Christmas movie that's out about the church, there's one that's out. I don't know if y'all can remember. It's one that's just out. We've already seen it. It's about... A church that's getting ready to go under and God starts to tell them about start, how to save the church. He says, plant a garden. Start gardening around. Who, who's seen the movie? You got a few people who saw it. It's about, it's, by the way, that's based on a real story. So when I go, go sit down and watch it, hey, this is real. This is about a real deal. It's because they move you because they're true. They're based in reality. And since they're real, they're accessible to me. And I can be part of this real story. I can, st I can, even after the story's told on the screen, I can call them up and talk to the people that were really in it if I had wanted to. So, the follow that when you look at this story that I'm getting ready to tell you, the actual events, look at this one here. Mary gives birth to a child. She's a virgin. She gives birth to a child. The Holy Spirit has come over her, as the scripture says, and that she was betrothed to a man named Joseph. And at that time, what they could do is because it appeared that she had been unfaithful to him, that he could put her away, but he chose not to. But this woman gives birth, and where does she give birth at? She gives birth in a stable. Hello, any of you ever give birth in a stable? Now, it wasn't that they had planned to do that. Now, God had planned for that to happen. But they had planned to be somewhere else other than where the governor had told them they had to go. Cyrenius had told them that 
they had to go do certain things, you know, that they weren't planning to take this trip in the middle of being pregnant. But there, the Bible tells us that why does she have this child in a stable? It's because, the, what does it ever say? There was no room for her in the inn, for the baby. There was, and it's like everybody was traveling. You've got to realize, everybody was traveling because they were all going to where they had to go back to their re respective homes. And they were in the midst of traveling. Everybody was traveling. That's why there was no room for them in the end. They were all traveling. And they got there a little late and she was pregnant. The Bible tells us that not even part of this story. Now, when we talk about the greatest story ever told, this story is made up of the elements of different people and different things. I want to do my best to plug in the most important ones. Can I do that? Because I got to tell you the most important, the greatest story ever told, that there were shepherds involved in this thing. At the reading, at the, when we began, we talked about the shepherds that were abiding in the field with their flocks. The angels appeared to them. An angel appeared to them. Can you imagine that? That's that angel moment. What's that? Did y'all see that thing the other night? That was that SpaceX rocket that took off and it looked like it was something from outer space. Did anybody see that? On, on You didn't see that? Well, that was everybody was standing there with their cameras the other night looking at in, in California at what is going on. Is this rocket? You need to get it. Check it out. It was a it was a moment. What is this? Well, that's the same thing that they were doing there with these angels. What is this? And they were telling them they got a message they got to tell them about these angels were there and they were telling them is what he says in Luke chapter two, verse 10. Look what he says here. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. That was the message from the angels. You get, see, you've you got to realize, if you're going to tell the greatest story ever told, this has to be a major line in your storytelling. It has to be a major part of the storytelling line. Without that in it, it's kind of like, okay, a baby was born. We're going to find him wrapped up in a clothes in the swaddling man. You can find a lot of that today. But this one here, that they, the angel said, he will be the Christ, the Christos. Does that make sense? So Christmas is a true story of the birth of Christ. Jesus is the greatest story in the universe. But the birth is just a scene in this greater story. And the story doesn't begin at Jesus. Well, we would say, a lot of people believe, this is where Jesus began at. No, that's where he entered into this reality at. He stepped out of his, earth, out of his heavenly reality and came into this reality that we're in. See, the story of Jesus doesn't begin in Bethlehem. It starts and he actually starts to show up and tells us more of the story is in the book of Genesis. It's in the creation. When you go all the way back to the beginning in your Bible, it's a story that tells about the garden, a garden experience where God had created man and woman and put them in a garden. And that they were going to populate the earth. You all know they were going to populate the earth like that. There would have been no sickness, no sin, no disease, nothing. They were going to populate the earth. And they were going to have an offspring. And death was never ever supposed to come to man. God shows us how death was supposed to happen. When, e when Enoch one day was walking with the Lord. Then all of a sudden God looks over to Enoch and says, hey. You're closer to my home than you are yours, Enoch. Come on home with me. And he stepped right through that veil. You see, everyone was supposed to go that way. But you see what takes place is that because in this garden, that sin entered into the garden and all of a sudden that there is a, a war that is taking place. That there's a fall. 
that in the, in the Bible, you find out that there is a cosmic battle between God and Satan, his rival, a rival, not on the same level. God is, he's all powerful. Satan is a created angel. And he has power. And he is there to deceive man. And through whatever way, some people say, well, I didn't, I didn't sin. No, you didn't sin, but your mom and your dad did. Is that you're, uh, back to Adam and Eve when God has set boundaries. And he does that to everybody's life. You know, he set boundaries in the garden. And that boundary was you can eat of all these trees, but of this tree you can't eat. And God does that in your life today. There's boundaries, and those boundaries are good for us. And when we decide to step out of those boundaries, we wind up just like Adam and Eve. We wind up into sin, and Adam and Eve stepped out of the boundaries of God and stepped into the temptation that the devil had, Satan had. And because of that, I'm not trying to tell you the story. I'm trying to tell you the greatest story ever told. If I don't tell you this, Christ's birth is just a scene in the story. He will be a savior. Savior from what? The Christos what? This is the story. This is why he did what he did. It was because, here's what he tells us in Genesis chapter 8, man chooses to write his own story. And that's what most people want to do. You want to write your own story. You don't want to do it the way God wants to do it. You want to write it your own way. And that's what Adam and Eve did. They wanted to write it their own way. Look at what he says here in Genesis chapter 3, 14 and 15. God told the serpent who had deceived Adam and Eve, Satan. He says, and the Lord said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field, Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And here's a good one. Here's the good part. He says, now I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Now he's talking about, he's talking about Satan. He says, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between thy seed. So Satan, look at this here, between thy seed and her seed. So Satan has a seed. Satan can have, Satan has a seed, and the woman shall have a seed. He's going to say to his now, her seed, it shall bruise thy head, but you're going to be able to bruise his heel. So right at the very beginning is a cryptic message about the story. And Satan doesn't get it all. He doesn't get he, do, he doesn't know everything, but God has a plan already of what's going to happen at this greatest story ever told. So the future characters are introduced into this story. There's a future characters. There is a man who will defeat the enemy. Because it says, his, his, you will be able to bruise his heel, not her heel, his heel. He knows it's a man. So now, all of a sudden, a man will defeat the enemy and restore creation to everything. So this is the first mention of your entire Bible of a hero. Not in Luke. In Genesis. This is the greatest story I could ever tell you. Is this? Am I boring you today? It's just a great, I mean, but you've heard it forever. It's like watching the Christmas story tonight at 8 o'clock. It's coming on and I've seen it every year. And I got the movie. And I can watch it every day. But I still like hearing the story and watching it. And say, well, hey, 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 this is the best part right here. Well, come here, come here, come here, come here. Come here, pause it back and say, friend, come here, you got to watch this. Look at this here. I never saw this before. Never saw this before. The promise of a hero, promise of a savior, Messiah. See, the character is a savior who wants something and overcomes. See, and you look at a story, anytime you look at the story of a savior, like Superman, 
Now, see, back in the day, Superman was a, he was a savior, a comic book savior. Batman was a comic book savior. Nowadays, they crooked. They have, they take on sinister look, man. Batman's crooked. Everybody's crooked in DC Comics now. There ain't nobody you can trust. The only one I trust is Dick Tracy. Yeah, he's a good one. But in the story, there's a Savior who wants something. The Savior is someone who is willing to overcome conflict to get, get, to get it. So the greatest story continues in the Old Testament. How is God going to bring about this, this Savior, this hero? God first now has to select a person. He has to select a group of people. And with the selection, he selects a people that is called the Jews. God looks across the earth and he says, how am I going to bring in this Savior, Christos, into the world to defeat Satan? He says, I got to have a plan. And the plan is, I got to have a group of people. So God looks across the face of the earth. He looks past the Egyptians, the Phoenicians. He looks past the Assyrians. He looks past down through time. He looks through all of creation. He looks for them. He says, and I got to find me a people, a nation that I can bring this through. And he, the promise of the Savior is that they are, uh, he selects the Jewish nation. This Jewish people is the smallest nation upon the earth it's despised nobody likes the jews the jews were such backwards people that they they had look at here they have no artistic value as far as making statues or paintings or anything like that like the egyptians did wouldn't you surely would have made the Egyptians? They could have, they could, they could have took, wrote pictures and writings and all this stuff. No, it was a group of people that nobody would have thought anything about. Less Satan would have thought, surely not them. And he chooses the most unlikely people to say, that's the one that I'm going to pick. And he chooses the Jews. Not only that, he picks a man out by the name of Abraham. And he comes to him and he says, through you, Abraham, will I bless all the nations of the earth. And I want you to know is that there was no revelation of God given to no other people. None of the other nations of the world knew of the revelation of, Je of, of Yahweh, of God. Nobody knew it. He only revealed himself to the Jews. All the other people before that time, they had no way of hope or salvation. They all died and went to a devil's hell. And God chose a nation. It's a great story. My Jesus, isn't this something? And all of a sudden he tells them, he says, listen, he says, I'm going to bless you. And a Savior will come. See, Abraham's always looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. He wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute and afflicted and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. These people here look for this God, this Savior to come. Waiting for a Messiah that would show up. And the prophets would give them clues. In the story, it's like a great detective story. It's the greatest story ever told. God gives us some type of clues about it. Are y'all ready to dig into some clues? Say, tell me more, Pastor. Have I preached too long? It's Act 1. See, no, I don't know where we're at in this thing. Page 3. How about that? And I got 15 pages. No, I'm just kidding. Don't freak out on me. I can fly through them. We can get to the end of it. You want the short cleft note version? I can give you that too. He gives us clues. Look what he says here in Isaiah 7 and verse 14. First clue, Isaiah 7 and 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. There's that word again. That angel. 
Same spirit talking. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name what? Let another clue. You ready for the another clue? You need to write these down in your Bible. It has to be part of the story. Look at what he says here in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Here's what he says. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And watch this here. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called what? What else? What else? What else? And what else? See, he tells us, he's revealing more. This is a clue. They didn't know about Luke 2. So you, already, you look back, they looking forward. They don't know about this thing. God just gives them a clue. He gives them clues of the greatest story. Look what he says in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. Here's the other one. But thou, Bethlehem, uh-oh, Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. Go, what is he talking about? Bethlehem, I want to get Bethlehem, Israel, everlasting. He shall be a ruler. You see, the story of this new character's birth, it fills with all type of amazement. In Luke 2, look here, there was that census that was taking place. Mary and Joseph had to be in the right place at the right time in Luke 2 to make that happen. They had to be at the right place at the right time to be in Bethlehem, Ephratah, to be at the right place at the right time for it to happen. And he used the Romans to make it happen. The heavenly host now appears to all the shepherds. And in other passages, we learn this here. Not only did the, the angels appear to the shepherds, but here. In other passages, we talked about this last week, but this is part of the real. So i got to tell you the greatest story ever told. I can't leave nothing out. Even though you, were, you weren't here last week. So i got to tell you. Mary and Joseph, you've got to realize that Mary and Joseph were separately visited by the angels to prepare them for the visit. See, Mary was told by the angel, hey, the Holy Ghost is going to come upon you and you're going to have a child. You're going to be impregnated. She go, what? Not only that, did an angel appear to Joseph, her husband, said, hey, listen, the thing that she's with, she's never been unfaithful, Joseph. I want you to know that. She's never been with a man. This is part of the story. And the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit has come over her. And what she is pregnated with is the Most High God. And he shall be the Savior. And Joseph's going, hey, I know some, there's, there's, some, there's, there's some clues about this in the Bible. There's some clues about it in Isaiah. There's some, there's some clues about it in Micah. There's some writings about this. And all of a sudden, God's using these people to make this come to pass. The star seems to have broken all the laws in the celestial physics to highlight this here in a stable in Bethlehem. Not only to guide the shepherds there, but several years later, you'll find out the wise men show up at their home and the star appears over their home. You see, some people want to take stellarium. That's not a drug. I know it sounds like a drug, but stellarium is not a drug. Stellarium is a, a program of astronomics stars and you can go backwards in time and look at the stars in heaven and see how far they back by not only hundreds of years but by thousands of years and go back and study the stars and many try to go back at around the birth time of Christ and say that there was a star that was there and it was a normal thing, a normal star that was in the, high, in, the, in the sky. 
But in reality, it was not. It, you can, it's not a natural thing. The star is supernatural. You're not going to be able to write one at bass. Oh, yeah, they were, Orion was over here, and that was over there, and that was comet. Was That's not it, y'all. Jesus, help me. It's supernatural. Or it's a natural Bible. This is a supernatural thing taking place. Somebody shout amen if you're on board with me. There's conflict in the story. Let's stay with the conflict. I hope I'm not wearing your patience out. But this is my only time to tell the greatest story ever told. It is Christmas Eve. And I know the Christmas story is coming on with little Ralphie. And Elf is just around the corner too. But there's a great conflict from the beginning. There's no room for them in the end. The, he, the Herod tries to kill all the Hebrew children in this story because the wise men had come looking for this Christ child. They go up to the king, that's King Herod, and say, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And Herod goes, what are you talking about, king of the Jews? You're looking at him. Oh, no, no, no. We saw his star in the east, and we've come to follow him. Herod says, look at here, here's what I want you to do. You go find him. You find him and you tell, this is a good story, y'all. This is a good plot. We can make a movie out of this. You go tell him, you tell me, you, when you find him, you come tell me where he's at so I can come worship the king of the Jews. And all of a sudden... The wise men go out, they find Jesus, there he is right over there, he's about two years old about now. Then all of a sudden they are warned in a dream by an angel, don't go back. Don't go back, not the way you came, you better not go tell Herod, he's going to kill you too. And Herod doesn't find out about where Jesus is at, but all of a sudden being warned... Joseph is told, get up, get out, and take your family out of Bethlehem and get to Egypt. Run! Because Herod's going to kill all the babies two years old and below. You better run! So they run. Do you know this is in your Bible? Do y'all know this is in your Bible? This is part of the greatest story ever told. Why was Satan trying to kill him? Because of the great conflict at the very beginning, that a Christ, a Christos, the anointed one was coming. And Satan knows it now. And he knows where he's at. We've got to get rid of him. Everybody, punch your neighbor say, wake up. Come on, y'all, wake up. Somebody say, wake up. Okay, I'm going to speed it up. I'm going to speed up. I'm going to speed this thing up. And we remember this story every year, and we need to remember the story of Christmas about the birth of Jesus. Because that story is part of God's greatest story, this birth. The greatest story ever told is being told right now. And we are part. It's a story where we are all part of this story, whether you believe it or not. You're part of this story. And the story God is writing includes characters. And this story includes their own characters within the story. And every person walking upon the face of the earth right now, you are part of this greatest story ever told. You are actually writing a story within God's story. You're writing it right now in your own life. A part of God's story. You're telling it. Me telling this story is part of God's story. He planned me to stand here and tell part of his story like the shepherds did. The shepherds were told to go tell everything they saw and they heard, and they were telling the story of what they knew. We're telling the story in a greater, greater realm now. You see, I look at people all around us who has had a story of serving God. I think about all great evangelists. I think of people like A.A. A. Allen. 
Now think of people like William Brandon or B. Medlin or, or old pastor I had, Reverend Eddie Renew or Brother Coleman. Or I think about other ministers that we have here, Bill George in the church or T.D. Schaefer and all the other ministers that we have here in the church that we are all part of, all our deliverance ministers, we are all part of God's and Sunday school teachers or whoever you are ministering, you're part of God's story. We're not left out as some type of an appendage, like an appendix. You know an appendix is something that's stuck onto your side over here? Do you know you can live without your appendix? They can just cut that thing, but not this here. What we are part of, we are part of the great story that could not be told without us. He's got us in the middle of it telling everybody about this. Angels can't tell this story. It takes man creation. It takes us Ministers and preachers and Sunday school teachers and you who were out there, uh, lay persons who were out there at church and where you're at everywhere, telling the greatest story ever told. Don't just say Merry Christmas. And when you have the opportunity to tell people, you need to tell them the whole story. Do you know, I had a friend at work who was pretty much atheist. And when I was at work, I was telling him about stuff like this here. He says, well, what about a Savior? Why about Jesus? Why about this here? And I started telling him about Jesus being born in a birth in that manger and sin. And all of a sudden, God spoke to me and he says, stop. He says, tell him everything. And God spoke to me and he says, here's what he said. He said, his IQ is 120. God, and I'm sitting in my office, God says, his IQ is 120. And I realized right then what God was telling me. I was leaving too much of the story out. People who are very, very smart, who have great IQs, you can't leave nothing out of the story. They don't understand it. They got to have one plus two plus three plus, it's, it's built upon it. You can't skip through the story. You got to tell them everything. And I changed the way I was ministering to him, and I started in Genesis chapter 3. And started telling him the greatest story I could ever tell at that time. So about a week later, I was in my office, and I said, man, let me ask you a question. You know, we're just kidding around. Let me ask you a question. I said, is your IQ 120? And he turned around and looked at me, he says... How do you know that? I said, I have a way of finding out. IQ, by the way, y'all, that's pretty high. 120. So telling the story and knowing how to tell the story is a great asset to people. You see, sometimes we try to Make it so that in our story that we're in, playing in this thing right here right now, we want to be the main focus in our own story. Or people who are here who are not saved, and you're not a Christian, who are listening to the greatest story ever told, you think this thing's about you. It is. A small portion of it. But let me finish telling the whole story. You see... We want to control the storyline. You see, and the end hasn't happened yet, but it's grand. It's a grand excitement. It's kind of like the fireworks is going to go off at the, at, yeah, you're sitting there watching fireworks over yonder at Midland Valley. You're watching them, watching them, watching them. Then, man, this is the grand finale. Look, they, they're cranking this thing up. Brothers and sisters, babies, we are in the grand finale of this thing. This is it. Think of great things happening in 2018. Think of great, God's going to do greater. It, the church is not going down. The church is going to go out of here in power and greater anointing than we've ever had. Or at least we have to make sure that we have the right focus on the greatest story ever told. You see, like Adam and Eve who lived in the garden, they rejected the divine author. And they chose to write their own story. And when we sin, we are writing our own story. We run from God. 
We run from church. We run, you hurt, you get in church, you get hurt. You say, oh God, don't love me. Yes, he does. You got to straighten it up. Shake it off. Come on. You know what we were doing a baseball team? He's a little cry baby over there. Got to kick you in the pants. Say, come on and get on board with this thing. Yeah, but they said something about me and they hurt me. That's your story. And we all struggle with things in our life and God's story doesn't match up with our story and what he wants us to do. We struggle and fight against it. We fight against God. And we cry out to him at times. And sometimes you blame God. But the story of Christmas is the story of God bringing his love and his compassion to the whole world. It's the story of the character of Jesus who wants something that overcomes conflict to get what he wanted and what he wanted more than anything was a family. He wanted you to be part of his family. You're part of the greatest story ever told as well. He's willing to do anything to get you. He's willing to lay aside anything he can do to keep you from dying and going to hell. And all we want to do is play church. We just want to play about God. He's done everything he can do. He left his heavenly kingdom. And he turned, he, he enters into a world that was created by him that turned against him. He forfeits his power. He forfeits his, he forfeits, and he comes in as a helpless baby in a manger. And he has to overcome conflict. To get you. He loves you so much. And the conflict at his birth. And at the end of his life, he still has to overcome conflict. And you want to become a Christian for your short few years. I don't love me. Nobody likes me. Oh, somebody sat in my seat. Oh, somebody. <laughs> Give me a break. When you're born in a manger, then I'll start listening to that crybaby attitude of yours. And at the end of his life, you see the full extent of this baby born in a manger now 33 years old. He grows up. He does miracles. He says, don't believe who I am. Believe the miracles I do. Blind eyes open. You still don't believe me. Raise the dead. You still don't believe me. Even if one came from the dead, wouldn't believe. Jesus is arrested falsely by the religious leaders of his time. He's accused. He's tried. He's convicted. He's condemned to a death on the cross. And that is where Jesus overcomes the greatest conflict he could ever overcome. He overcomes the greatest thing that started back in the garden. And the reason we're here and the reason we do church is because of sin and death. And there's nothing that I can do about your sin. There's nothing I can do about your death except tell you about Jesus Christ. That you don't have to die and go to hell. He overcomes Satan. He's made a way so that you can go back and spend it in a garden with him forever. It's the greatest story ever told. But I don't like this story. The greatest story is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The character is Jesus. He wants something. He wants you to give you life and for you to live forever with him. He overcomes conflict on the cross. And by going to the cross and dying for your sin, he was your substitute. Because if you don't turn to Jesus, the penalty of your sin is death. And it's death and punishment. Eternal separation from God. You can live, you can go and live on another planet with him, if that's what you want to say. If you want to get it world, you can get in, you go, go to heaven with him. And that's the greatest story ever told. And here's the amazing thing that we need to believe that since it's the greatest story ever told, we can be part of his story. 
And that's why I say if Jesus doesn't come back, make sure you run this at my funeral. Don't preach demons. Don't talk about demons. Don't talk about healing. Don't talk about miracles. Talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's inclusive of that, but the greatest story ever told is he died for your sin. That's the greatest story ever told. And it's being written right now. You can join in and be part of it. And every moment of every day, we're writing a story, and we can choose what character we want to be in that. And we can choose the outcome of it. it listen to this here. You can choose. You know, you, know, you know how they got... You know how they got movies that comes up to a certain scene, and on your DVR, you can select the ending, alternate endings? Who knows what I'm talking about? Y'all don't know what... Man, I'm telling you what. They got movies. You can rent. And you can have several alternate endings. There's the regular one. And then you can go through there and you select, I want to see this ending of the story. And it plays out another storyline. Or you can select another one. You can watch that storyline out. And here's what I'm going to tell you about your storyline that you're writing right now. Unless you serve Jesus... I know what your storyline is, and if you don't turn to him, you will wind up in a devil's hell. But you can change. You can have an alternate ending. It don't have to be like that. You can change it today. You say, I don't want to go down that ending. I want to go down the ending that Jesus Christ will walk me through the valley of the shadow of death. And he will see me through that time. He will escort me with his angels to the other side. That's the ending that I want to see. Somebody shout amen. It's the alternate ending of the greatest story ever told. But it's real simple. It's real simple. It's a matter of saying, oh my God. Somebody say, oh my God. I'm dying. I'm lost, and I don't want to go down that road of hell. I want to be saved today. Lord, let this Christmas season be a change in my life forever. And forgive me of my sin. Wash me, Lord. Make me clean. Lord, that I will be able to be part of the greatest story ever told on that side of it. Come and give the Lord a hand clap of praise in the house. No, come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise in the house. That's your alternate ending right there. My Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Think about all the lost people out there. Think about all the lost people out there today that you're going to know that you're going to visit this weekend. That you know of your own family. Of your own families. And do not really understand the greatest story ever told. They don't understand it. Raise your hands. Oh my God. Help me Lord. To be able to tell. The greatest story. Ever told. Thank you Lord. For what you have done in my life. I receive you Lord. I make a fresh commitment to you. To tell the greatest story ever been told to all my friends and all my people do the song oh come let us adore him can you do that let's do that let's do it together oh.